Hey guys, welcome back to the Overmatch Podcast. I'm your host, as per freaking usual, and this is Caffeine and Questions 10. So this is the 10th time we've done this. And so I, basically I put out a thing on YouTube, or not on YouTube, on social media, on Instagram, and say, hey, you asked me some questions, and I get a ton of questions. And I try to work my way through them, and they bring me off in segues and kind of side stories here, there, and everywhere. So don't be expecting, if you've never tuned into this, don't be expecting a whole lot of structure because it's kind of scattered. So I was thinking what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of catch everybody up on what's going on, but I won't do that because a lot of the questions kind of pertain to what's going on. So we'll get there eventually, and if I miss anything, I'll catch it up at the end. Um, I have no real structure for this. I just I have my iPad open from all the questions, and I just wandered through them with no script. The downside of that is I may end up asking answering questions I already answered before, but uh, I'm sure I'm probably going to answer them in a different way. Um, the good part of that is it's not structured. It's not kind of scripted. It's just off the cuff. Favorite thing about what you're doing now um, pertaining to working for myself and, and basically working from home. The favorite thing about working um, in Overmatch right now is the amount of time I have. I have so much time in my hands because I was pouring a lot of time into my old job. And... Now I wake up in the morning and I'm like, normally I have 10 things to, to accomplish by noon. Now I'm like, I got 10 things to accomplish by Friday and it's Tuesday. <laughs> um, I have tons of time on my hands. Now I am busy sometimes, but I, I'm able to manage that myself and take it easy when I've got it easy and then work hard when, when the work is there. So that, that's kind of my favorite thing. It's, it, it's pretty cool. Um with a CQB rifle, zero at 25 or 50. I zero at 25 with a red dot just because most of the shots for CQB are pretty close range. Pretty simple. Um, ETA on the next YouTube video. So by the time this goes out, we probably already had one. I did a Zoom call with Ushin, who's a doctor in Ireland who was in, in America for about a year. And we talked about the Invincibles in the late 1800s in Ireland. Uh, that were kind of an assassination squad. So that was a pretty good Zoom call podcast. So that would have been out. What I have lined up, uh, this one will probably go out after that. I interviewed Clay Martin, who was in um, SF with me. He was in sniper school with me. And he, he has written a couple of books. I interviewed Clay on Zoom. I sat down with the command sergeant major in charge of all training in special forces, Lee Strong, and we talked a lot about standards and and you know how to prepare and all that. He, Lee's a great guy, personal friend of mine. We were team sergeants together, so I, I once that's edited and out, I, I highly encourage you if you're thinking of a soft career or even if you're in soft and you want to talk about or you want to we we talk about free fall school and all kinds of stuff. So that that's a good one coming up. Um. So they're the, they're the ones in the queue being edited now, right? Just got to, it takes time. Um, pretty small operation here. Uh, coming back to Arizona in time soon. Probably not. <laughs> I like Arizona in the winter. In, 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 in the summer, it's like the hot part of hell in Arizona. It's brutally hot. And standing on a range all day in Arizona in summer is is not fun. Um, the thing I do now is I try not to get on a freaking plane because I hate it. I have to fly to Utah here soon to, for the Marine Corps, but I'll drive. Like, I just drove to Arizona. No, I'm sorry. Drove to Arkansas, 14-hour drive to train the instructors from the Army National Guard Sniper School for a week. And I drove back by myself. Um, so I will sooner do that than get on a flight. Because when you're on a flight, you have no control. And the last time, I hadn't flown in a while, and the last time I was coming back from Utah from training with the Marine Corps, of course, uh, it was supposed to change flights in Colorado, and Colorado was snowed out, and we got directed to a smaller airport and sat there for like six, I was a nightmare. And I just hate the loss of control. I'd rather just throw my crap in my van and drive. So driving to Arizona, mm, probably not. Sorry, bro. Have you ever worked with JTF2 from Canada? Oh, not operationally. I was at Todd Hodnets and Accuracy First in Texas training one time when they were there. And a great bunch of guys. They train very regularly and, and very professional outfit. Is it Derry or London Derry? It's Derry, okay? Unless you're... I don't know. It depends who you are. But to me, it's Derry. For people who are like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> Derry's a city in Northern Ireland, and the British call it London Derry, and the Irish call it Derry. 
Quick overview of fitness standards. I assume this young man means for special operations. Um, I hope he doesn't mean fitness standards for retired has been from SF because there are no fitness standards for me now. But for so that again, the command sergeant major from um, special forces, we got into all that stuff. We actually talked about how you're assessed in selection. Um, and there's a list of standards you're assessed by. It's all very standardized and all that. And, and he is absolutely the right guy in the right place at the right time. So th that will be answered there. Red dot for EDC pistol or plate carrier and armor ends up at the same price. I don't know what plate carrying armor you're getting that costs the same as a red dot site or you're paying too much for red dot site, but I'm not sure why you need a plate carrying armor, honestly. Um, red dots are great on pistols. I don't have one on my on my carry gun. I have a basic Glock, standard Glock 19. Um, I would say save your money and buy ammo and get really, really good with your gun, with your handgun. Okay, go to the range and, 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 and practice drills and get really, really good. Um... I like red dots, especially when you get older and you're wearing reading glasses. It's hard to focus on that front sight, but um, for an EDC gun, it's just one more thing to snag on clothes, and I don't need it. Um, what kind of rifle would I need to bring to your long gun class? I own a 30-odd six for hunting. Okay, Mike. <laughs> I like people that bring whatever they have. However... When you bring a 30-odd-6 with a with a scope on it, with no parallax knob and all that, I end up focusing a lot of attention on you and trying to fix issues. And um, I don't want to neglect other people on the line. So what I would say is, if that's the only gun you have and you want it for hunting, you're not going to get the value of that 30-odd-6 um, at distance, right? 30-odd-6 is an old bullet. It's 100 years old or more. And it's it's just for so people know like you have seven seven point six two right um, a NATO seven six two is seven six two by fifty one this is a seven six two by sixty three I think it's a very old cartridge um, if you're hunting with it and you have a scope and you're zeroing and you're shooting hundred meters or it's fine however if you want to go to a class that has targets out to a thousand yards and you want to gain all the value from the class that you can. Then I would I would um, I would kind of encourage you to bring something else or rent a gun from me. I have a couple of guns I rent at the class with optics and everything zeroed, and uh, they're three oh eights, and I charge you a hundred bucks, and you can shoot that gun for the class. You can get the education you need. All that education can still be applied to your thirty odd six in a very very practical way. However, I I I don't want you struggling trying to. Because if you're shooting a gun like that, right, that was not really designed for long range, although at the time it was, but it's kind of been been outpaced. I don't want you missing a distance and not knowing if it's your zero, if it's your gun, your capability, your position. You know, you have to narrow things down so you can get the best from the class. And if that's what you, all you have and that's what you want to bring, we'll figure it out. But I, I think you would be better to bring something else. Um, Actually, the same guy said, I... I would like to buy a 308 Ruger Scout, but the barrel is shorter. What do you suggest? I, I like the, the. I think I'm going to buy one of them. The, the, the Ruger Scout 308 is a really nice little rifle. I don't care if the barrel's shorter. What does the short barrel mean? It means your muzzle velocity is lower. We're still going to figure it out. We're still going to zero it and chrono it, and we're going to make it crush everything out the, out the distance, right? Um, I had a guy that trained with me recently. <laughs> And he had a 16-inch gas gun. He tried to sign up for a different class or a different company or trainer, trainer, and they told him you can't shoot that for long distance. It won't go out past 300, which is absolute garbage. Two instructors from Range 37 won the international sniper competition at Fort Benning with two 16-inch gas guns. I think 2010 or something like that, right? A 16-inch gun is not less accurate. It just has... It's more time in the air. It gets pushed by more. It's got higher angle departure. It gets pushed by the wind. But it's, data is data. You can still make it work out to long distance, right? So absolutely bring your um, bring your Ruger Scout. And I, I think I'm going to buy one of them. them. Them things are really, really nice. I had I actually ran a carbine class one time, and, and a young lady brought one of them, and it was freaking great. Um Odd question, but would Vinny fit in in Ireland or would people see him as an unnecessary, as unnecessary to own? I heard people over there uh, see owning certain breeds 
uh, just like owning an AR. I, I think what you mean is, I remember when I was stationed in Germany, there were certain breeds that you were not allowed to have. Rottweiler, um, Pitbull, I think, maybe Doberman, which is a German dog anyway. But so I don't know what Ireland is like now. And, you know, I hate answering questions about Ireland because I'm referring to Ireland in the 80s, 90s when I was growing up there, not right now. So um, I don't know what the standards are. It's it's so crazy, but you get some Rottweilers and they're the biggest babies, the most gentle dog ever, right? Of course, they have the propensity if they, you know, go nuts or if they're badly treated or badly raised that they can do damage, right? A freaking chihuahua is not going to do a lot of damage if it, if, it, if it's a mean dog. But all dogs are, are a product of how they're trained and how they're raised and how they're loved. Um, Vinny's a big baby. He's the most gentle, loving, affectionate, calm dog I've ever seen in my life. He is a baby. Like, like if a, dog, a chihuahua could attack Vinny and he wouldn't fight him back. Like, he is phenomenal. And it's just the way. It's his breed. It's his temperament. his personality. But he was trained properly. And people ask me about Vinny, and I'll talk about that later on. So I don't know what the standard is in Ireland. Ireland has some very weird laws. And they're really weird because I've lived in America for so long. When I grew up there, and they were just a law. I didn't know. Though. I didn't see them as weird. You have to have a license for a TV still. And... Growing up, you had to have a license for a TV. And if you have a TV and you don't have a license, they'll give you a fine. And, and I looked it up recently to see if it was still a law, and it is. And if you have two TVs, you need two licenses. To me, that is just insane that you have to pay the government to have a license. It doesn't make any sense. And Maybe there's justification. You have to have a license for a dog. I, I don't know. There, so there's some strange European laws that only seem strange now because I've lived in America for so long. I don't give me hate mail from Ireland. I'm just telling you the truth. What barracks did you do recruit training in? So I just noticed that this came in from a James Clinton, and I did basic training with a James Clinton, but I don't think it's the same one. I might be his kid. I don't know. I did barracks in Dund- I did training in Dundalk and Aiken Barracks, um, and there was a James Clinton in my platoon. Funny guy, great dude. Um, but I, I, I did training and I think all training is now standardized. Somebody told me that it's all standardized in Dakura, if I got that right. But back then it was all over the place and we did it in Nundog. Um Biggest cultural differences, professional, private, living in, outside the US. Cheers from Sweden. All right. Thanks, Sweden. Um, tough one to answer because, again, I am talking about when I reference Ireland, I reference Ireland from the 90s, and it might not be the same, right? I find that in the United States, and it may be changing because this, this country is changing fast and not in a good way, but generally, hard work is... Um, I find that you can make it in America if you bust your ass and work hard, generally, right? Right? There's not a lot of things you can't do. Now, obviously, I can't be a linebacker for the freaking Dallas Cowboys. You know what I mean? I, I don't... <laughs> yeah, I, I could be a mascot, maybe. But obviously, if you don't have the intelligence or you don't have the, the, the build or whatever, the, the physical capabilities, you can't do certain things, right? But generally, if you're willing to pursue the education, you're willing to pursue the... the um, the tough, hard work of being in special operations or, you know, you want to be a cop, you want to go into the FBI. If you're willing to do the work, there's not a lot of things that will stop you. You can get there, right, within your own physical and mental capabilities, okay? Um, growing up in Ireland, it was not like that. And again, that was Ireland from back in the day. But if you want, and maybe just it, it's, a, it's a product of this country being so freaking big. There's 330 million people in this country. It's a massive, massive com- country. So there's a lot of opportunities, right? But if I wanted to be, um, I'm trying to pick something that I could actually do. <laughs> um, I don't know. Pick, pick a, If I want to be a firefighter, I could have been a firefighter. I could have been a cop. could have been, you know, things within my physical and mental capability. I, I couldn't have been a freaking psychiatrist probably I, I probably couldn't well maybe I could I'd be too blunt <laughs> people stop whining get off the couch and go and do some PT um but who knows I've come far further in this country than I ever thought I would but I, I find that growing up in Ireland it wasn't when I graduated high school it wasn't like what do I want to be it was what job can I get 
Now, I know in Ireland is not like, I'm going to get some hate mail for this, but hey, people listen to me because I tell the freaking truth. And if you don't like the truth, it's it's my opinion. You don't have to agree with me. But when I grew up, it wasn't like, what do I want to do? It was, what job can I get? And then you'd open a paper because there was no internet and you'd look for jobs and there'd be no jobs, like not even one. And you had to do an apprenticeship to be, uh, like if you want to trade, you had to do an apprenticeship for a certain amount of time and all that kind of thing. So I just find, you know, I, I was talking to my daughter about this a while ago. You're in the best country in the world for accomplishing your goals if you're willing to do the work. But there's no free lunch. That's what I like about it. Uh, that's what I think is different for me. For a left-handed shooter, learn right-hand bolt gun. Find the lefty bolt gun or just get a gas gun. <laughs> All of the above. I did a video. It's on my YouTube about a lefty shooting a right-hand bolt gun. And it's good for prone. It's good for zeroing. It doesn't really work for, for kneeling and standing and stuff. Gas guns are so good these days. Um, which with, look, with smaller calibers, 308s, 6.5s. You can get them. And it didn't used to be like this. But you can get a gas gun that's as accurate as a bolt gun, one three oh eight. So, um, and I have two of them in there that's as accurate as a bolt gun. So, um, for a lefty, I, I I'd get a left hand bolt gun or I'd get a gas gun because what happens is when a lefty, see if I can do this. Uh, and if you're on video, you can see this. If you're not, you can't. But what a lefty does, they shoot with their right, if the gun on their left shoulder, the sand sock held with their right hand, and when they shoot. You have to let go of the sand sock to rack the bolt, and you lose the target every time, okay? And it's it's vital that you see your impact and make a second shot correction quickly, and it kind of mess, messes that up, okay? So I would, of all those answers, I'd say get a gas gun. What kind of things are covered on the driving course? So we have another driving course coming up in September, and it's on the website as Vehicle Dynamics. So... It's very difficult to do this in most places because you have cars and you have fuel and you have liability and the track and all that kind of thing. But if you notice, I could do pistol and carbine and all kinds of stuff. I just don't want to do the same stuff as everybody else. And I really don't want to stand in the range all day teaching pistol and carbine. But uh, vehicle dynamics is something nobody else does. It's, um, it's a one-day course that you can take. Um, there were two 16-year-olds at the last one with their parents, with their dad. So... As long as you can drive, you can take it. And it, it deals with surviving around your vehicle because we're all in our vehicle so freaking much. And we have to pull into gas stations. The gas stations are creepy places. I don't care where they are. And we have to, we're, we're a little vulnerable, right? Um, so it, it deals with your vehicle. So it starts off with a little bit of class on, on kind of mindset and how fear affects the body. And then we go into the law and how castle doctrine affects you in your car as opposed to outside your car, what you can and cannot do, um, imminent threat, hostile intent, um, and it, with an emphasis to avoidance and, and situational awareness and avoiding trouble and getting away. Somebody tailgates you on the highway, just move over. Don't get into this road rage things. Hundreds of people are killed in road rage. Um, it's getting worse. It's not an American problem. It's all over the freaking world. It's worse in a lot of other countries. But it, it's an emphasis on being very legal and, and avoidance and getting away from stuff. And then uh, that goes up to lunchtime. Then in the afternoon, we split the class into two groups. Half goes driving and half does scenario-based training with simunitions at a gas pump, road rage, um, car hijacking, stuff like that. So you can actually get that adrenaline and stress and you can react. And uh, we use simunition guns. And our, our, we don't shoot at you, but uh, our role player is heavily protected. So you can shoot at him and you can you can you know grab him and, and get physical with him basically because he's well protected. And then you don't have to driving. <laughs> And the instructor at the driving course, David, is a phenomenal instructor. You'll do speed. You'll drive faster than you ever drove before. We did a whole law enforcement um, uh, cone course where you got to do this thing in under a minute. You'll do it a couple of times. You'll do pit maneuver. You'll do react to pit maneuver. You'll do um, manipulating the car to be able to get out of danger quickly, right? So it's an evasive driving course. It's a situational awareness course. It's a scenario-based training course that'll just change the way you look at the driving thing. And what I've done was I didn't want to make this course. It's very hard to price courses out, right? Because you don't want to make a course that's only available for, for people who have tons of money. So the course is 500 bucks. And there's not a lot of money in it for profit-wise, but it's something that's very, very important to us. And but I would get on that quickly if you if you uh, can take a look at it. It's in September. Phenomenal course that you really can't get anywhere else. Um, 
Do leprechauns wear shorts so the grass doesn't tickle their balls when they run through it? Leprechauns don't wear shorts because their balls are so big, they, they need pants. All right, that's, that's all I got. Um, biggest gut check you ever had. Why does everybody want to hear this? This is on the last one as well. Um, I've said many, many times, nothing I did in the army was as hard as people made it out to be before I went. Except Seer School. Seer School is Survive, Escape, Resist, Evade. And it's the escape and evasion prison course that I did. And at the time, we didn't know anything about it. Now they know all kinds. There's so much intel out there. But and it wasn't really a gut check. It was just something I mentally wasn't prepared for because I didn't know anything. And I kind of purposely didn't care. I was like, I'll just deal with it. Well, when they rolled us up after the escape and evasion portion and they had us handcuffed and all that, um, uh, the guy whipped the, the hood off my head and he hit me so freaking hard. That shit hurt. And uh, that was a little bit of a gut check. Um, but other than that, it was a long process of a lot of hard training. But nothing was really, really like, oh, my God, this is awful. Honestly, nothing. Um, and maybe that's easy for me to say in hindsight, but I, I don't remember ever thinking in selection, this is terrible, I'm going to quit. I, I just didn't think that way at the time. How slash when do you decide to disengage and seek new AO jobs versus surly and fix it? I think that that means if you're in a job you hate and how do you know when to disengage? And I just did a two hour Zoom call with a, a, a gentleman on leadership and we talked through leadership and, and, you know, he was having problems with, you know, some of the employees and I gave him some strategies and some things that, and it's not like, Yelling, screaming, doing push-ups, right? It's not the military. you got to deal with it within the parameters of the HR world. But you should be using HR as a weapon. Um, you should be learning HR as a leader, I'm talking about, as, as a weapon that you can use against dirtbags if you're trying to get rid of them. Now, if you're in a job and you hate it and your boss is an asshole, as soon as you're bringing it home with you and it's affecting your mental health, you should be looking. Now, you should always be looking for another move. Now, you shouldn't move like I did until you have another job to go to, but you should always be looking outward to find another job and use that job as a springboard to another job and constantly be looking. And when the time is right, if it's affecting your mental health and your family life and you're bringing it home with you, cut sling load and go. You won't look back. Can you make some heavyweight overmatch long sleeve shirts? I don't know. Let's sell a couple of hundred we have in storage right now that, that we have. Uh, that's a Kirsten thing. Um, she can answer that one. But, you know, there's no money in shirts and hats. There's a couple of dollars per. They're more of a marketing thing. Um, but I'm not. Buy a shirt. If you're watching this, get on the website, buy a shirt, buy a hat. Come on. Hook a, hook a brother up. And subscribe to the damn YouTube channel. All you got to do is hit that little button. Not that hard. It's not a big commitment. It's not like we're engaged or anything. Just hit the little subscribe button. And if you've that, you've a fear of commitment, and you probably never get married. Um, what is the Vinny? What is Vinny's official background? Is he a retired working dog or long time buddy? Okay, so Vinny was donated to me by a nonprofit because I am a hundred percent disabled veteran, right? And I had never had a Malinois in my life, but I'd worked extensively with Malinois in the past. So I got hooked up with a company called Labs for Liberty out of Utah, and I went there for a week. And they were basically teaching me, we were bonding, and they were teaching me how to, you know, you know, work Vinny and all the commands and all that. And it's funny because they have a little house on the property on the ranch and you stay there and they, they introduce you and, you know, you, you, you're not bonded yet. It, it takes a little while, right? But you, you start, you know, walking him and, and playing fetch and stuff like that. And then the first night I was in that uh, little cabin with Vinny, he slept not in the bedroom, but he slept in the couch in the sitting room, right? And then the second night, he slept in the same room as me, and but he was on a separate bed. And then the third night, he was on the bed, and he hasn't gone off the bed since. He's, he is so... And he gets stressed. I was away, like I said, I was at the National Guard in, in Arkansas for a week, and he was so stressed. Like, he is such a clingy dog. Um, and he's here with my wife, and she treats him well, and she walks him and feeds him and, and throws frisbee with him and... and but he has that bond, um, and, and like he's upstairs now probably, and he's losing his mind. He would much rather be down here, which I should have brought him down. But he was donated to me as a, he's a service dog, which is cool because I could bring him anywhere except into an operating room in a hospital and certain parts of the zoo. That's what they told me. And then 
Um, I, I mean, that, this privilege of having a service dog in hotels and all that, people abuse it because it, it, it's people can't ask you um, why do you have a service dog? Or, and there's no paperwork and all that kind of thing, which I'd be fine if there was. But until that law is passed, don't ask me, right? So they can ask you, um, is he a service dog? Yes. What service does he provide? Mobility. Boom. That's it. We're done talking. And I've had, it hasn't happened very much because it's more mainstream now. But I stayed in a small hotel and I went in and they're like, oh, you can't have a dog in here. I, you can't have a pet. I said, he's not a pet. He's a service animal. You can't have him. Um, I said, all right, bro, let me, let me help you out here, right? You want to pursue this? I will fucking sue your ass, all right? And they, they were stuck. They were just, they weren't used to it. And I was nice initially, but the guy kept pushing back, pushing back. No, 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 no. And I was like, all right, stop, all right? Um, generally, they'll say, they'll ask you those questions. And if you answer the questions, they're fine with it, especially in the bigger hotels, um, any training near Michigan coming up soon? That's a long way away too. Um, probably not. It's kind of far. I have, I'm working, well, I get through the schedule here in a little bit. Uh, how do you take your tea? I take it with milk and no sugar. I don't drink tea that much anymore. I drink it in the morning and that's it. I drink a lot of Monster, like I really do, more than I should. Any good ways to think about assessing and building buy-in regarding security. I think what that question, some of these questions are hard to understand. I think what you mean there, brother, is buy, get your family to buy in on security measures. I think you have to make it fun. You have to make it fun and make it a game and make it kind of, because it, it nobody wants to think about that and it's boring and you don't want to do fear tactics, but try to, especially with your kids, try to make it fun, okay? Uh Will you host a class in Florida at some point? I'd love to. I've been reaching out, and Kirsten's been reaching out to, to ranges and go, hey, we'd like to run a range at your range, and most of them don't even answer back. So if you ha know of a range, then send me a message, send me an email, and as long as they have a classroom and at least 800, six, 800 meters, I'll, I'll run a class there. As long as they don't try to charge me a shit ton of money, um, then I will actually run a class there. And I would love to come to Florida in the winter. Um... But I'm always looking for new places. I got one lined up in Virginia, which I'll talk about here soon. And I'm, I'm always looking for new places. How much caffeine do you consume daily? LOL. LOL yourself. Did I tell the truth? I, I, I always tell the truth. About four monsters probably a day, which is terrible. But hey, it's not that I don't know it's bad for me. It's just I don't care. Um, whew. What kind of knife do you carry daily? I don't carry a knife. I actually carry a little folding knife like this big in my pocket and I use it to open monster cans because I have no fingernails. That's it. I don't carry a knife. Um, here's a great question and it made me pause. If you had to be rescued and could choose any non-US soft unit to do it, who would you choose? That's actually a great question. You know who I'd probably choose? The Iraqi counter-terrorist force. You think about it. People are like, what? You think about it, right? Who has more experience than ISOF now at this point, right? So the Iraqi counter-terrorist force was selected and trained by American special forces. They actually took them and selected them. And if you look at an Instagram account called Omar underscore ICTF, I think it is. Omar was an ICTF operator in Iraq. He now lives in Texas. And he's like a big old redneck Texan with a hat and toothpick and dress pickup truck, and he's an awesome dude. But these guys were selected in Iraq at the start of the Iraq war, after the, the, the invasion, right? And they were pulled out and taken to Jordan for months and selected and trained and equipped and put back in. And then they operated with American special forces for years. And then when the Americans pulled out and ISIS rolled in, it was the ICTF or ISOF brigade that stopped ISIS taking all of Iraq and maybe more of the Middle East. Um, they lost it. I mean, they stood their ground and killed these guys in big numbers and lost a lot of guys. Very, very hard fighters, very capable fighters. And when you talk about experience being the best teacher, they are probably the most experienced operators in the world. They are at it constantly. They have an Instagram page called, uh, oh man, ISOF or something like that. They, they post stuff on there all the time. They are pipers. I fought side by side with them. And they are out there doing it all the time. So, um, yep, if I'm ever taken hostage, ICTF boys, come get me, boys. Um, 
we'll 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 hang out afterwards. See you in a couple of weeks at the class. When will you host Garantham? Content involving you both. So I've talked to Mike a couple of times. He has a range now out in Idaho, and he wanted me to come out and run a long gun class there for civilians, and I'd love to, but I haven't heard from him recently. So get on his Instagram and tell him he needs to freaking contact me and bring me out there, and I will run a long gun course with him out in Idaho, and we'll do a bunch of content together. I actually really like Mike. He is... uh, He's very, very good at what he does, right? And he doesn't take himself too seriously, and he doesn't freaking, you know, he's actually very, very good. And I don't know how he gets away with it on Instagram, because I've posted one picture of a gun, and they flag the crap out of me. And it's not this, you know, people used to be like, I'm shadow banned and all this, and, and it was their excuse for having a crappy post. But you can go into Instagram now and go into settings and go into account and account status, and it'll tell you, because of these three posts, we are not sharing your account with anybody. And I tried to play ball, and I tried to play the game, and I went in there and I looked and I deleted those posts that had that were offensive to them. And you know, twenty four hours later, the account's back up in good status because I I stagnated where I am at six seventy thousand or something. I just stopped, and I, I so that's why it, it, nobody can see it, nobody can can. Uh, and somebody hit me up and said they weren't even allowed to like a post at one point. So I deleted those posts with guns, and then I went back up in good standing, and then. I went back in, and there's more posts from later on. And I'm, I'm done. I'm done playing ball. I'm just going to post guns from now on. I don't freaking care. I'm done trying to play nice uh, because you can't get on. You can't. You know, there, there's there's a point in saying, okay, there's, it's their platform. you got to play by their rules. But at a certain point, it's like, all right, this is freaking ridiculous, right? So, all right, you want to you shadow ban me? Go ahead. But Mike, Mike Jones has all kinds of crap on there. Every post he has is guns, and he has a freaking million followers or something. But... I, I don't get it. Maybe he knows somebody who knows somebody. But get on Mike's platform and say, hey, you need to bring Kevin Owens out there to bring have a long gun class, and I'll go. I'd love to. Uh, it was funny because when I started in this whole world, and of course I knew nothing, I don't know much more now, but I went out to Mike, and I was, we did the, the MRAD, right? When the, when the Barrett MRAD first got officially announced that it was uh, the firearm, which I'm seeing those show up at all the schools now, which is freaking awesome. But So we did some content on that, and I had like 700 followers or something, and Mike cross-promoted me, and I refreshed my Instagram, and I had 7,000. <laughs> it was weird. Um, in all your years of deployment, how many rounds do you figure you fired? No idea. Um, how many rounds does a minigun fire? That's, that's, I have no idea, man. Millions, probably. Favorite place you've traveled in the U.S.? So I talked, I thought about this, and I was trying to figure it out. I've gone to some really, really cool places. But one stands out. When me and my wife were newly married, we were driving across the country, and we stopped at the Grand Canyon, and we hiked to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, camped overnight at the Colorado River, and hiked out the next day. And that was kind of special. That was pretty badass. Um, Hiking out was a lot harder than hiking in. But it was really, really cool because there's, you know, the Grand Canyon is always packed, but there's nobody at the bottom. There's too much work. And there was a few people there, but it was really, really cool. That kind of stands out. There's another one, actually, I just thought of. There's a place up in, good Lord, I'm going to forget the name of it now, upstate New York at Lake George. And there's a hike there called Little Finger. And it's about 600 feet, I think, or maybe a little less, but it's six pitches. And you couldn't get to the to the hike from the ground. You had a canoe to the bottom of the hike. So we rented a canoe. We threw all my rock climbing gear in there. We canoed to the bottom of the hike, climbed out, and I led the pitches. And then she came up, and I led it. And, you know, and we sat at the top of that mountain on Lake George in upstate New York, and the whole freaking massive lake is in front of you. That was pretty special, too. I could probably keep going on. I've been to it. I've been really, really lucky. And I've, I've seen a lot of really cool stuff. Do you miss Ireland? Again, I'm going to piss everybody out. No, I don't miss Ireland. <laughs> you know, I miss my family. I have family still over there, but life goes on. I, I, And I'm not, people are like, is Ireland better than, than is America better than Ireland? Ireland the con- certain countries suit certain people. Ireland suits me. I'm sorry, United States suits me. Um, Ireland did not suit me, and that's why I left. Um, I don't, I've been here so long. I've actually been in the United States longer than I lived in Ireland at this point. So Ireland's just this distant place that I grew up. I'd love to go back. I did a podcast, which is probably already posted, but with Oshin, and we were talking about Irish history, and I was saying to him, I would love to go back to Ireland. 
and go around all these historical sites with Oshin and with some of the people he knows that are really, really smart on all this stuff and do YouTube videos on all this Irish history stuff. How badass would that be? If I had the money, I would absolutely do it, but I don't have the money. Um, so, no, don't really miss Ireland. Um, could you do a video on, on mentoring you use to give to quiet guys? So, Josh, I think what you're talking about there, brother, is when I did all the podcasts about my career, I talked about being a first sergeant at the Warrior Leader Course, which is the soft leadership school for junior, junior special operations. And we used to do, every week we'd do peers, where everybody would peer the top three in the class and the bottom three, and I'd say, why? And the first week... Um, the bottom three, because they'd only been there a week, they didn't really know each other that much. The bottom three in each class, and I think I had nine or ten classes um, with 18 in each. Um, the bottom three, the comments would usually be, he's too quiet, he doesn't talk, he doesn't socialize, he doesn't mix with people, all right? So I would pull those kids into my office and very, very calm. I'd let them sit down, I'd chill out, I'd be like, relax, this is not an ass chewing. Uh, and I'd tell them what people said and, I, and I'd be... Look, I would rather a quiet guy than a loudmouth asshole that never shuts the fuck up. I just would. Um, however, you're in an MOS, you're in a job where you kind of got to be an outgoing guy and you got to try to build that confidence. So I want you to try to get out of your shell. I want you to interact more and I want you to... And sometimes people just need to be told, right? And I never once saw those kids back in my office the next week with the same comments. I just never did. Um, that's what you mean about counseling and mentoring young guys who are very, very quiet. It's just a personality. It doesn't mean it's bad. It's actually not a bad thing at all. I would rather humility than freaking ego. I'd rather a quiet guy than a loud mouth. Um, but there's a little bit of a middle ground, especially in, in a, in a um, MOS, in a job where you have to go in to a foreign army, a train a battalion, and you've got to be the, ba the, 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 the guy. I remember when I was in um, Robin Sage, the culmination exercise for special operations in the Q course. And I was very senior. I was an E7 when I was in Robin Sage. But our G chief, our guerrilla chief, was a, he was freaking awesome. He was a Vietnam veteran for special forces. And he, um, so he was the guerrilla chief and we were working with these guerrillas and we had a very young 18 X-ray, young guy on our team. And he went out on a mission and got lost. Man got found and came back, right? Even though he's, shit happens, right? Not the end of the world. Even though he passed land nav and all, and he was trained. So the the guerrilla chief sat with me, and we got on very, very well. And he said, hey, what you should do is make him teach a land nav class to the guerrillas to boost his confidence, to, to correct it. And I said, that's a great idea. So I said, you're going you're gonna to do a land nav class for the indige, right, for the guerrillas. And he got up there in front of all the um, the guerrillas, and he said, Hey, I'm the last person that should be teaching a land nav class, but I'm going to teach. And this uh, this G chief, I wish I could remember his name. He pulled him aside and he was like, "Don't you ever downplay yourself like that." To these indeed, you're the man. You're a freaking warrior. Don't ever put yourself down like that in front of people. Like you know. And he was absolutely right. You, you've you've destroyed your credibility, and it it accomplishes nothing. Now, humility is great, but there's a certain time to put it away and be the man, all right? Um, anyway, don't know how I get off on that tangent. Uh, what is your favorite non-sniper weapon to shoot when you were still serving? Minigun. M134. Minigun. I've shot the minigun a lot. I've never actually gunned on it in combat, but I went to a, a minigun course in Dillon for a week or two weeks, and uh, we went out to the desert and tore up gazillions of rounds. Um, that's your taxpayer dollars right there. <laughs> Good. Um, new Land Cruiser, too much tech, reliability, or too expensive? I'm not a Land Cruiser guy, man. Don't have one, never had one, probably would never pay for one. Um, here's all, all, the, all the overlanders. Um, they're tied into these Toyota Tacomas. I have an F-150, man. I love that thing. I have a deck system in the back. It's packed with long-range shooting equipment. And all I have to do is load up my guns and go. And it's completely packed out. And I take my Sprinter van a lot of places too. Um, but if if I'm not paying for a Land Cruiser that's shit tons of money and um, a lot of tech does have a lot of reliability problems when something goes wrong, it's very expensive to fix it up. Um 
but again, I'm not the guy to answer because I've never owned a Land Cruiser. I did a lot of Land Rover stuff in Ireland, but never owned a Land Cruiser, so I'm really not qualified to answer that question. This is a really good question. Is there one piece of gear or kit that you could improve? What would if if there was one piece of kit that you or gear that you could improve? What would it be? Example: boots that last longer, batteries, um, power consumption is a huge problem in the military. Batteries, batteries, batteries. Everything's battery powered. Everything, and you have solar, but it's not good enough. Um, think about being in the field for weeks and maintaining batteries. We had this little crank thing; it looked like a bicycle when, when I was in uh, Robin Sage. That we would generate battery. We, I've seen things in Force Mod where they would, uh, you know, they had I don't know none of this is classified. I don't think they had like an exoskeleton legs that when you walked it, it generated batteries. It had a backpack that moved when you walk to generate batteries and recharge. I mean, it was a fucking pain in the ass. The last thing you want is your backpack bouncing up and down. That's the difference between what an engineer comes up with and what a soldier. Soldier looks at that and go, oh, hell no, I don't want my backpack moving when I walk. Um, batteries are a huge problem on everything. You think about it. Like you go into a hide, a sniper hide for three days, batteries, man. Everything's batteries and everything's getting crushed. And batteries are better. You've lithium batteries and stuff now, but still cold weather's going to zap them. Um, battery power. If you could figure that one out, you, you'll be a millionaire. Um, that's a great question. Did you run a 416? Uh, if so, did you like it? Never ran a 416 professionally. How did you meet Vinny? I already answered that. Steyr Aug versus M4. M4. M4 is just... I have an M4 in there. It's freaking badass. But I, I love the M4. All right. There's other guns I like too, but I, I do love the M4. And I did carry this tire for a while. Um, have you worked with the ARW in recent years? Would you be curious to see its progress? I'd love to. The last time I, I mean, I've run into ARW guys at sniper comps a couple of times. And, um, but in 2010, I think it was when I was a sniper instructor, I got sent back to Ireland for three weeks to do an international counter-terrorist sniper course. And that's the last I, I kind of interacted with them professionally. You know, other than that, it's just kind of, you know, personally. I'd love to see where they are now. They've gone leaps and bounds from where they were, um, just from what I've seen uh, with equipment and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's funny because two different people ask the same question. That's just weird. Um and then another one that's slightly different. Have the Irish Army ever asked you to come back and do present to do presentations or courses? No, they have not. They actually have brought Todd Hodnett's son over there to teach him long range shooting, um, because he reached out to me and he asked me where to go, and I'm like, uh, I don't know, man. I left Ireland a very long time ago. Watch the podcast they did with Rushin, and we talk about things to see in Ireland. So they've brought Todd's son over to teach long range shooting, but no, they've never asked me. Um, any recommendation for ballistic calculator apps? Sri Lanka Pro is removed because of U.S. sanctions. Yeah, look, I, I've been looking into this because not everybody wants to spend seven hundred bucks on a, on a Kestrel, and I think you, you should be going towards Kestrel, right? But if you want to ease into it, there's an app that I've downloaded and I've messed with it a little bit, and it seems quite good called Geo Ballistics. And again, I always think when I push something, people think I'm getting paid. Let me just put this on the record: I am not paid by any company for anything I do. And that's why I have no money. Um, so that geo ballistics is quite a good one. People are using it at comps there. Um, so you can build your gun. You can actually Bluetooth to your Kestrel if you want. I'm not sure why you would do that. Um, if you have atmospherics are the problem, right, with your phone. But you can plug in atmospherics manually. You can Bluetooth to a Kestrel or you can hook it. You can have it uh, connect to a local weather station to pull down the weather and the atmospheric data for you, right? So... What I've heard, I haven't done a ton with it, but what I've heard, it's actually quite good. And it's like 10 bucks, right? So it's a good place to start. And and Ballistic Calculator is a great educational tool because I can go, okay, if I took this shot at 800 meters and this is my data, what would it be with a 20 degree down angle? And you can see all that. It's a great way to kind of figure stuff out. So um, that's a good one. Geo Ballistics, from what I've seen and what I've heard from people who use it a lot, Okay. Vortex Fury 5000 with applied ballistics or SIG Kilo 6K for range finding bino. So I have, I don't have a 6K SIG. I have a 5K SIG and I have a 10K SIG and they're both phenomenal. But they have this BDX app that you pull data from and you hook it straight to the, the, the 5K 
Bluetooth to the Kestrel. The 10K has this BDX app like the 6K, right? And it's just an app and you pull in ballistics and all that kind of thing and it gives you it in your rangefinder, right? Um, the Vortex Fury does the same thing with applied ballistics. So I have used applied ballistics for years and years and years. I've used SIG 5K and 10K for a long time. I've never used a Vortex Fury, but I hear good things. So the thing about ballistics apps what the army were talking about, so SOF has applied ballistics in all orchestras, right? The army were talking about, develop, when I was running Force Mod, the army were talking about developing their own ballistic calculator because it's just math, right? And I was like, I, I'm not interested. I won't buy it for SOF. And they were like, why not? Because it'll never get updated, right? The army will put it out there, they'll close the door and they'll, they'll move on. Applied ballistics is updated all the friggin' time. And maybe maybe SIG's uh, BDX data is too, but I know Brian Litz personally, and he is the most attentive um, micro analysis guy I've ever met in my life. And he's, he's an awesome guy. But the applied ballistics data, every time I turn my Kessler on, there's an update on it. So that is because they're building new bullets and putting new stuff into the custom drag model and all that. So I'm very, very tied to applied ballistics. But um, SIG is a phenomenal company to put out great products too. And the, the Vortex is also a great company. And the Vortex binos are really, really nice. I, range finding binos like that are great for hunting because they double as a pair of binos and um, a range finder. And I was on the range day before yesterday and I was using my SIG Kilo 10K. I have the mount that clips onto the really right stuff tripod and I was using it as a spot and I could see trace with it perfectly because the glass is so clear. I think you can't go wrong with either one. Here's an answer. Whichever one's cheaper. <laughs> I sound like a cheap fucker. Um, uh, in your opinion, what will be the next major advancement in individual soldiers' kit and capability? So, I don't want to get into anything classified right now, but drones, drones, drones. And counter-drone comes from drone, right? Um, individual soldiers with drones there are drones now and i'm not getting into the cleaning class but there's drones that you can fly into a building or an underground cave system or an underground bunker for weapons and it will map the whole structure for you right there are drones that are the size like tiny like four inches long that you can launch they'll fly out 20 minutes they have a thermal camera a day camera um to be ability to get up high and see stuff is huge right um now there's ground drones there's sea drones. They're, 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 whether people ever say it or not, the goal is to replace soldiers on the battlefield with robots, right? And it sounds very Terminator-ish, right? Um, but there is cameras now with facial recognition, and you can you can tell a camera, hey, I want you to look for guns, these types of guns, or I want you to look for these faces and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it'll do it. Now, it's not a kick in the ass away from putting a gun to that thing, and telling it when you see this gun, then open fire, right? And I asked that question one time in a meeting, and, and why doesn't it? Why don't you give it the autonomy to make the decision? The people are like future future generations will judge you. It's judgment day, right? And I, but I I don't think I think right now the U.S. is not doing that. There's always a human in the talk chain. I know that for a fact. However, if you were in a war and things were getting bad, the other side were doing it. You think we wouldn't do it? We do it in a heartbeat. We would jump at it. So technology is friggin' jumping. You think about, remember the TV show Friends? It doesn't seem that long ago. No cell phones. No freaking cell phones, right? Um, and you look at where cell phones and technologies are now. It's almost like we got alien. We can talk, I'm not saying we did. I'm just saying it's almost like we got alien technology because it just goes so friggin' fast. So I think drones, ground drones, sea drones, and, and uh, um, air drones, uh, and then counter drone is a huge problem when that happens, right? Because counter drone is a two step thing. It's detection and interdiction. And both are a huge problem set on their own, right? So the mechanized, uh, computerized battlefield is coming and it's coming hard. I, I thought it was interesting. I saw a thing in, on um, social media the other day. The TSA now have facial recognition, biometric cameras at all the. Uh, Airport, and not at all, but at, but at some of the airports where they scan your face and your biometric and your eye, your retina scan and all that kind of thing. And this is what we used to do to people in foreign countries when we rolled them up because we're documenting them all. And apparently it's, it's, it's not mandatory. You can opt out of it, but there's no signs anywhere to tell you you can opt out of it. 
So they hide the signs because they want everybody to do it. And the government's taking all that data and keeping it. For what? I don't know. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but the more you see these conspiracies come through, you, you got to ask yourself. Um, the digital currency stuff in the future really scares me because that's common where it'll get to the point where um, they'll make it really easy and really convenient and initially. But as soon as something happens like COVID, they have the mechanism in place to shut you down and not let you travel and not yet buy guns with digital currency and all that thing. I, I, I think there's there's a lot of bad times coming because the government's just getting worse and worse and worse. And they're all the same. Democrats and, and Republicans. I think I heard you mention you're running a Galil. Yeah, I was in Somalia. I'd f- what caliber was this? 556 Galil. What's the most fun that you, gun that you own? I like shooting 556, man. I love it. I like shooting 308 as well. But um, I really like shooting 556. Uh, can you bring a gas gun or and a bolt gun to your long gun course? Yeah, bring them both. Um, look, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hamstring you, right? Day one's all classroom because you need to understand the why and the ballistics behind it. But if you want to bring two guns, bring two guns with zero bolts with chrono growth, and you'll go to work with both, and you'll walk away with data for both. Um, it's your time. What you do on the range is up to you, and I will help you get through it. It's good practice. Uh. I get this question all the time, right? How would an Irish soldier who spent the last eight years in the infantry and uh, Lebanon trip get a job and move to the U.S.? I am not an immigration officer, brother. I don't know. And immigration rules change all the time. Go to the INS website and figure it out. You come here on holiday and marry an American chick. There you go. Boom. Um, stay with my daughters. <laughs> um I, I cut this one off. Why has the government uh, do you, uh, kind of vilified the use of the word militia when the Infantry Museum has a monument militia? Great, great, great question, right? Um, I don't know. But if you've ever been on to Fort Benning or in that area, there's a great U.S. Infantry Museum there, which I'm going to go to, I swear, in the next couple of weeks. And I'm going to do content on. They have some great stuff in there. That is really, really cool to see. How hard is language school in the Q course? And is it common or unusual for guys to fail? Again, 20 years ago, I went. I got French because I wanted French. Um, at the time, French, you know, obviously an Africa language, French, Portuguese. Um, I did French in high school, and I actually tried in language school for four months. I busted my ass, did my homework, did it because I wanted to be fluent, and I wanted to get language pay at the end, because I had freaking four kids at that time, and, and, and I was an E7. So I actually tried. Now, French is an easy language for um, English speakers compared to Mandarin Chinese, um, Russian. So it depends on the language you get, how hard it is. Um, some languages are harder than others, but it's, it's how you apply. I don't know if people, um, uh, fail that much. Probably not because they'll, they, when I left, when I finished graduate language school, it was like zero plus zero plus on the bus, right? You needed a very minimal level. Now you need a much higher level. So that I got that out of talking to the, the Q, the Swick CSM. When I talked to him, like people will say, everybody thinks the Q course and selection and all it was all harder back in my day. When I went, it was harder. And um, again, language school is harder, harder, higher level. But selection, when I went to selection, selection standards are pretty much the same. Um, but when I went and you're doing individual land navigation, the weights are the same and all that. There were times when I was running low on time and I'd jump on a road and I'd just haul ass up the road, which you're not allowed to do. Now, and as long as you don't get caught... Um, you're good. But now they have tracking devices on you. They have tracker vests. They can tell if you're running, walking, sleeping. Um, they can tell, they can pinpoint where you are on this big map at all times. So you can't do that. So by that aspect alone, it's harder. Okay. Um, next, what is your favorite thing about America? I, I think, you know, I, I actually have a lot of followers in different countries and I think Americans get a bad rap. My favorite thing about America is the people. America has some of the friendliest, nicest people you'll ever meet in your life. Now, again, there's 330 million people in this country. So, yep, we got scumbags, we got dirtbags, we got drug dealers, we got criminals. Yeah, like everybody else, right? Just on a bigger scale. But when I go to these courses and I train people or I do Zoom calls and stuff like that, phenomenal people. Absolutely phenomenal. And, and uh, I, that's why I like traveling and I like meeting people because they're, they're, I've had no bad experiences, really. Um, 
how goes the Sprinter van or did it go bye bye? Overall opinion. No, I still have my Sprinter van. Um, it's awesome. I would, if I was going to, now that I've had it for a year and a half or more, if I was going to, if I had the money and the technical skills, which I have neater, I would build it out. I'd buy a strip Sprinter van with air conditioning in the back and I would build my bed and I would build, because it has the, uh, uh, the toilet in it, but it goes on the outside. It's a chemical toilet, right? Um, it has uh, the shower, and it has. I, I would put the shower at the back, like my old Sprinter van had, and I'd take an outside shower. I'd suck it up. Um, the shower's in, it's great, but it's so freaking tight. It's like you, you climbed into a coffin and somebody stood you up, and you can't move it. And I'm not a big dude. Um, so I would change that. I would. Um, what else would I change about it? It's great. For what I do and all the traveling I do, it's great. Like I drove down to Arkansas. I just drive and drive and drive. And when I get tired, I pull into a rest stop and I rack out for a couple hours. And I get up and I go again. And it has an onboard generator that's propane. that lasts actually a long time. Um, and I, I need that to run the air conditioning, obviously. But um, I freaking love that van. It's badass. And, and uh, it really does help me in what I do today so i still have it i should do content on that you know um if you notice i don't do as much content as i used to instagram's a pain in the ass and i just it's time consuming um uh want to get into long range hunting what scope should i get if i had around 1500 if you could push that budget to about two grand um look at vortex go to vortex's web page i actually pulled it up here for that reason where is it Oh, God. Um, Vortec has a, a Viper PSD Gen 2, which is 3 to 15 power, and it's 1100 bucks. That's actually a really good price. Um, but it has some other ones that are about 1900 Really good. And then, believe it or not, go to EOTech. Look at EOTech. Now, I thought EOTech just made red dot sites, but they, they've, they've come out with a new line of scopes, which I have two of them, so I can actually speak to this, and it's the EOTech Voodoo. Um, there's one here I'm looking at. It's a 3.5 to 18, which I have in one of my guns, and it's 1800 bucks. That's a really good price for a very good quality optic. Um, so look at that. I would say <laughs> don't get it in minutes of angle. Get it in mils. And if you come to my course with, with a, a minute of angle scope, we'll figure it out and we'll get it done. But a lot of the speed shooting formulas I have um, are in mills because they're built for the military. The military shoot in mills. They don't shoot in minutes of angle. Um, it's important to understand both. But whatever you do, if, if your turret's minute of angle, your scope should be minute, your reticle should be minute of angle. And if your turret's uh, mill, your reticle should be mill, right? Um, but take a, take a look at EOTech. Look at the website and take a look at the Vortex line. Um, pretty decent scopes for under around two grand. Okay, and I have two uh, EOTex in there, and I've been very happy with them. They're on the guns that you rent if you come to my class if you want to rent a gun. Yeah, this is a different guy, but it's thirty odd six, a good all around caliber. Talked to that already, right? Um, Seven six two by sixty three, I think it is. Old round. Uh, not great, okay? There's better rounds out there if you're going to buy one. If you already have it, you should get trained on it, but there's better rounds out there. Um, how old is Vinny? Um, six. I had to look at my wife. Vinny's six. I haven't had him since I was a puppy. I just got him when I retired. He, he was imported from Belgium to be a police dog, and then he failed selection. <laughs> He's not... Vinny doesn't want to bite people. He's just the nicest dog ever. So another guy had him initially... And I was, I was looking for a Malinois because of my experience in the military with Malinois. So I reached out to this company and I didn't hear it for a couple of months. And then they had, this kid had Vinny and his name was actually Jimmy. And when I got him, I changed the name to Vinny. He didn't even notice. It sounds the same. And, and I had a dog in the military. I didn't have a dog, but we had a dog in the military that was killed on target by a suicide bomber called Vinny. So... Um, they reached out to me and they said, we got this Malinois. He was returned by somebody who said he was aggressive and he bit one of his kids. I got to call bullshit. That's a lie because Vinny will not bite anybody. Like, never going to happen, right? So, I, well, he's an animal. You don't know, but Vinny is not aggressive. So um, I talked to the trainer and he said, I've tried to make this dog bite me and he won't. 
And I, I am 100% sure he's not aggressive. So I went down there and I spent time with him, like I said earlier on. And I think what happened, this kid got him and tried to make him into a bike dog. And Vinny, Vinny wouldn't do it. And so he gave him back. Great for me. And Vinny's a good suit for me. Um, but I had him, I got him. Malin was, they go into this teenage period when they're like a year old to two years old. And we're just nuts, um, like teenage boys. And uh, so I got him right at the end of that. And I've had him since two, since I got out in 2000. So about three years I've had him. Uh, but he's he's freaking phenomenal, um, but that that's that's how I got him. Um, what's the longest shot you've ever taken while serving? I don't know. You talking about training or combat? Um, in training, I went up to Red Rocks Canyon in Utah with Todd Hodden at one time in accuracy first. I went up there with a group from third group, uh, a team from third group, and we were shooting extreme long range with 50 cal barrets. And we were shooting these Ralphus rounds, which explode on impact. And if you imagine like a whole wall on the Red Rocks Canyon, and you just pick a, you go, okay, let's shoot something at two grand. And you'd lay something, and you go, okay, that, that rock sticking out there is at 2,000. So you get the gun up, and you get it all up there. And a lot of times, you don't have enough elevation in your turret. So you dial everything on the turret and you still don't have enough. And then you end up holding everything inside your on your reticle and you still don't have enough. So you have to stack mills up the mountain to get enough. And I think we went out to three grand on this. And then you're holding wind. So then you got to stack wind all the way across and you're holding completely off the target. And you send that thing and it's got like eight seconds or something, time of flight, or maybe not that long, but that bullet flies and you have time to sit down, take a drink of your monster, get on spot and scope and watch. And then when the round hits, it explodes. And that was freaking phenomenal, man. That was really cool. I think we went out to three grand on that, 2,500, three grand, something. There's the longest shooting I've ever done in my life. Why? Just fun and taxpayers money. So why not? Um, the, in combat, look, look, I don't really want to talk about this, but in combat, these extreme long shots are very rare, right? Number one, you got a target ID. Number two, like in Afghanistan, if you're in a village or something, these guys are taking pot shots at you from another village, a click away, and, and yep, we can hit them easily. However, he's shooting through a little crack in a hole in a, in a wall, and he's blasting rounds in your general direction. He's not hitting anything; he's just harassing fire. So by the time you get on glass and find him, he's gone. Um, a lot harder, right? In a city, it's generally 400 and in, uh, and that's why the one to six optics were designed for for there were there were um, that requirement was filled for a, a 556 14 5 gas gun uh with a suppressor on it with a one to six because you can basically do anything you need to do inside the city with that and you can power it down and clear a house okay um why do some guys have wrap around the base of some handguards on precision rifle no idea um uh you once mentioned that every SF group has a personality. Could you explain that? I asked the command sergeant major about this because he had served in first group, third group, and seventh group throughout his career. And um, he said it's absolutely true. And it, they tend to take the personality of their air, area of operation sometimes, right? So seventh group is in Florida, and they mostly deal with South America. And I did go to Afghanistan and all that kind of thing too, but... Um, that group is very obviously Hispanic kind of a um, lot of lot of native speakers down there. That that group is very tenth group is in Colorado and Germany, European kind of personality, right? Um, first group is deals with um, like the Far East, right? And uh, a lot of Asian culture in that group, right? So I didn't think of that until he said it. It kind of ties to the group, but also ties to the area of operations that they work in. And uh, check out the podcast I do with him. It's very interesting. Um, what suppressors in your experience do while switching between 6.5 bolt and 3? I don't know. As long as you have a 308 suppressor, it'll work on a 6.5. It'll work on a, on a, on a 5.56 five, as long as it's smaller. Um, there's specs where you, you, you take the suppressor off. And as long as the shift is predictable, you're good. But most of my experience with suppressors are surefire because it's the military. I have a couple of suppressors, but I, I, I don't know. I don't feel comfortable answering that question. Um... When are you writing a book? Not writing a book. Um, I missed one somewhere. Mm. Would you ever be willing to have your wife on as guest? Um, okay, here's what's going on. Um, there were some good questions there. I know I go off on tangents, but... So, 
the last <laughs> the last video I, we put out on YouTube was Kate and Kirsten talking about herbal medicine. <laughs> it's so funny because some douchebag wrote, I can't believe you put this up. Unsubscribe. <laughs> Like, I give a shit if you unsubscribe. How? Don't let the door hit you on the way out there, buddy. Um, but this is the entitled little whiny little bitch society that we have now in some cases, right? You're mad at me for putting a video that you don't like on my free content that you don't have to watch. It's so fucking terrible. It's actually a great podcast. It's really educational. Two great women. And it, I found it very, very educational to watch. If you haven't seen that, I, get over your 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 your... It's not hippie stuff. Get over it and just talk about it. Just, just listen to it. It's about health and stuff like that. And there's some good stuff in there. Um, the I talked about the YouTube videos coming up. Just got back from Ar Arkansas. I talked about that. So coming up now, we're in mid-August. At the end of August, I have a two-day long gun class in North Carolina, which is full. Then the whole month of September, I will be in Camp Lejeune, uh, training with the Marine Corps. So I am I am a contracted trainer for MARSOC, Marine Special Operations, who run a level one course. It's the same course as run at Fort Bragg, but for the Marines. And so the whole month of September, I'll come home on the weekends, but Monday to Friday, I'll be in Camp Lejeune training that. I'm really looking forward to that. It, it's a huge privilege for me to do it. I'm super psyched about it. Great bunch of guys. Um, that's September. There's also a... a Vehicle Dynamics Defensive Driving Course in September. Please check that out. Uh, it's on a Saturday, I think, right? Uh, yep. Um, then October, I am training a law enforcement SWAT team here in North Carolina for three straight days on sniper stuff. And then I'm going out to the Arkansas Tactical Officers Association, I think 10, 12 uh, October driving again, 14 hours, 12 hours, um, to Little Rock, Arkansas, to train an advanced sniper class for the Arkansas Tactical Officers Association. I did it last year, but really looking forward to that. Great group of guys, really, really like that. Then I'll drive back to North Carolina and then immediately get on a plane and fly to Utah. And the last two weeks of October and the first week of November, I am with the Marine Corps for the Level 1 MARSOC Sniper Course in... Um, Dugway Proving Grounds on the west side of Salt Lake City in Utah. I was there a couple of months in March. Dear say it won't be as hot this time. Um, but actually, I wasn't there in March. I was there in May. But um, I'm out there for three weeks, three weeks doing the advanced stuff for that long-range shooting course there. Um, I'm looking at um, Pig River. Uh, it's a shooting facility in Rocky Mount, uh, Virginia. Uh, in the first week of December. It's not on the website yet, so don't look for it, but it's going to go up soon. I'm going to do a two-day long-range long range course there. I've been talking to the owner. Seems like a great guy. I'm going to do a two-day long-range course there, I think 9, 10 December, okay? Uh, so that'll be the next civilian course, and it does fill up quickly, so, so try to get in there. You'll learn a ton of stuff, and that'll bring us up to um, the end of the year. So... Um, it's been a crazy year. A lot of stuff got done. A lot of work. Um, I know the social media stuff I've dropped off a little bit, but it's just it, it it's time consuming. Editing is insanely time consuming. It's like you, you film for ten minutes. It takes an hour to freaking edit it. Um, if you have questions, you can always reach out to me. I did a, oh the Zoom training. I've done a bunch of Zoom training, and it's very very popular. So if you want to get into long range shooting, you can do a two hour Zoom call with me. And we'll sit down and walk through it step by step by step with ballistics. And I've done a couple. Um, I charge 200 bucks an hour, but it is so worth it. It is one-on-one -on -one training where you can ask questions. I have a little computer simulator. I have uh, another, I have a PowerPoint and I have a, a thing where I can write and show you wind and wind calls and all that kind of thing. And I've had people do two two-hour sessions and then come to a class and they're just crushing it. Um but if you want to do so, I did one earlier on today on leadership for two hours with a supervisor who was dealing with some issues with his people and I give him some advice and I, I talk through some stuff and I give him some examples of, of what I did in situations like that. So that's available too. Um, I want to do map reading because I like teaching it and I think it's cool. However, I, I, I'm not sure it'll sell. And for me to put it on, I have to buy a bunch of maps and compasses, which are expensive and I don't want to commit to that if I can't sell the class. But if I thought there was a market, right, it's not one I could do on Zoom. It's just, it's not really fit for that, right? Um, 
Kirsten's also available for Zoom training. She's done some on Active Shooter over Zoom. She's done some on uh, personal security. She's done some on um, identifying threats. She's done some on firearms. She's done some on situational awareness. And it, it's um, it's really beneficial. And especially, here's where I would see it. If, let's say, you're a, you're a mom and you have a young daughter, both of you could sit down on the computer and talk to Kirsten for an hour or two and talk about situational awareness and threat mitigation and seeing things before they happen and how to be safe. She's 12 years experience as a police officer and she's really, really good at it. So that's another thing that is available. Um, we've also done some private training. I've had some people come down here to North Carolina and I've trained them privately on the range for a day or two days. And Kirsten, at the same time, Kirsten trained the, their wife, uh, the guy's wife on, on pistol and, and a little bit of situational awareness and stuff like that. So we, we do have a lot going on. Um, if you're listening to this, this goes out on YouTube. It goes out on Spotify and iTunes, right? And I don't know if it goes out. It might go on Google as well. But if you're listening, you can make a donation. If you want to support the podcast, totally up to you um, uh, on the podcast platform. You can't do it on on, on YouTube. But um, if you want to buy a T-shirt, just go to our website, overmatchconsulting.com. Um, go in there and click services. Is that what you click for training? I think it is, right? Yeah, I get lost on that website. But you go in there and click services, and then you go in there and see what training we have. It's not a ton, but I'm not hiring a bunch of people to go all over the country. Uh, I, I, I'm very, very in tune to um, hold the standards, right? Um, I, I can't let that drop. I just won't let that drop. And, and the more you grow, the more overhead you have, and the more you lose control. So um, I, I, I would only let people I really, really trust, like Kirsten, do training for me. Okay? All right, guys, that's it. That was kind of a long one. Um, upcoming podcasts, um, CSM Lee Strong coming soon, Clay Martin, Ushin and the Invincible should be already up there. And uh, any more ideas, just let me know. And uh, until the next time. Okay, thanks. Bye.